I'm the fifth generation twine maker working on this site. My great great grandfather settled here in 1837, and we've been making um, twine and cordage ever since. Um, the reason he settled here was that um, flax had been grown here since certainly since 1310 when the village paid tithes to the vicar to ship hemp and flax to Bridport. So it's a long established industry. And uh, we were moving from a cottage industry to the factory system in the mid 19th century. Um, and he built these buildings over a period of time. This particular one is about 1880, 1890. Um, and the, the product, flax twine, initially was for um, sail making for sewing up the um, sailcloth that again was made locally from flax in, um, on hand looms in, in cottages. And then that went again to the factory system in the mid 19th century in Krukan and on the um, fringes of this village. So that we then had a product that we couldn't sell because they could make it on broad looms at the size they needed. So we then um, diversified into um, upholstery twines um, and all sorts of uh, even parcel twines, page cord for printers and I've got a list of the products we were exhibiting at the Festival of Britain in 1951. I think there were 22 or 23 um, items, none of which are used today. So um, that presented a bit of a problem in the 60s and 70s but fortunately my uncle who ran the business when I arrived 44 years ago, um, had had the sense to get involved with a factory in Martok and in fact took over the plaiting and braiding side of that factory in 1956 and brought them up here and, and diversified our range in the same market but a completely different product. So uh, that then got us into synthetic fibres in yacht ropes um, and I'm still involved in, in making braids both nylon, polyesters and, and uh, natural fibres, jute and cotton, um, which go into all sorts of, uh, of different products. Is your market just the UK for the, all of these twines now or has that gone further afield? Essentially um, the UK because, because of the foreign influence initially with Portugal and places like that, now with China, um, the, the volume stuff is, is produced so cheaply you can't look at it. And I, I deal in um, very specialist areas, usually in, this, in the UK, sometimes in aerospace, which goes worldwide obviously, but um, essentially aerospace manufacturing in this country, with sort of um, builders, merchants. One of the great drawbacks of modern, cheap, synthetic cordage, whether it's rope or twine, is you can't tie knots in it. And the good old fashioned jute and hemp are tactile and you, you can tie knots. And if you try and put a, a fence panel on your roof rack, you essentially need a piece of juice sash cord, not a, a nasty length of that horrible blue stuff. They won't tie knots. Could you explain, obviously we, we're used to seeing the nylon twine, is the difference between or how you, you make your twine as opposed to the, the nylon version that we see every day? Um, by nylon twine you mean synthetic. Mm. Um, uh, packaging twine, uh, the sort of stuff that come, well, used to come around parcels and that sort of thing, um, took over from, from Sisal. Sisal was the cheap end of the market. Um, but my products are braided or plaited, which essentially is um, on the principle of a maypole. And you've got eight kids going one way, eight kids going the other, or whatever number, and they intertwine at each point. So it's a very simple weaving process. Whereas twine uh, goes back to the old principle of spinning wool, that the fibres, um, you, you twist the fibres and they um, hold together and if you then lay those yarns back in the opposite direction the whole thing the twist of the item whether it's a rope or a piece of twine is balanced and will hold together. So the product you're making is fairly unique um, and specialised in the twine um, overall thing is is there many people in the, the world or the UK doing that type of product? Um, there are specialist braiders in all sorts of things like Kevlar, in wire, in textiles and so on. In the 60s, the Plaited Cordage Manufacturers Association probably had 50 or 60 members. I should think there are now less than 10 in the whole field of, of braiding, which would include 
um, covering coax cable for all the sort of um, TV and, and um, computer industries and so on. Um, and it's, it's amazing how many things are still braided. The um, earth straps on um, dynamos and things like that are, are solid copper wire, but they're not solid, they're braided to give them the flexibility. So braiding is a, it's a very old um, industry. The fascinating history, obviously, behind all of this is, for yourself, you know, where could you see yourself being in five, ten years' time that's still within this industry? or Retired. Retired. <laughs> and that's going to take you know, the, the, this whole site and this you know, the business that you're running, where, what's going to happen to that? The whole lot is listed. It is a heritage site. So I think, uh, bear in mind that we're alongside a very similar um, factory down the road, which has, has been... Uh, it's owned by the local council and is going to be run as the restoration proceeds by the Coco Rope and Sale Trust. So there's quite a heritage site there and I think this will probably be complementary to it. Quite how much of this site will be preserved, I don't know. The Pacific craft of obviously toy making and what have you is where can you see that going for you? Obviously yourself saying you retire, can you, are you bringing family members in or are young people trying to get into this business? <laughs> No, I, I don't see, um, I, I think the contraction is, is so quick and has been over the last 20 years that um, I, I can't see that, I, I was approached by Plessy the other day to produce um, an olive drab cord, fairly, fairly straightforward um, high volume cord, but they wanted to source it in the UK for, from a sort of military point of view. And that's getting harder and harder, you know, and I think there will before very long come a time when there'll be a real problem with with sourcing specialist materials in, in this country. How does that make you feel now? Because obviously it's, it's fifth generation, I think you believe you mm. said, um, for that industry to be dying. How does that, for yourself, make you feel? Well, it's very sad, obviously. Yeah. And, and I, you know, without being political, that there is a, you have to have, well, I believe you have to have manufacturing in this country. Mm -hmm. And successive governments who decided we don't need to. We can live on banking and insurance and things. So that's the basic problem. If you could, what, what, how would you change, you know, so you, this industry that you're obviously passionate about continued to grow or, or, or there was a continued presence in the UK, what would you do? Um, I think it's too late. You need some sort of uh, youngster with, with vision and, and flair, um, but it's an uphill struggle. People, that the whole mindset of people has changed from buying a quality product that will last them a lifetime to buying some cheap and cheerful rubbish that they'll throw after two years. And the more affluent we become, the happier we are to throw stuff away. So there's no real way forward that you can see that I you can't know, see this, it, no. this industry no. is going to no. die. Are there alternatives that people like yourself could go into to keep the, the, the type of the industry going? I suppose that the, there would be a sort of um, almost a handicraft aspect of it if, if you went back to um, recreating some, yeah, on, on, a, on a heritage type, um, museum type uh, thing, I think you could perhaps um, recreate, as we're going to do in the other time walk, actually making it the way they did a hundred years ago. Um, to keep the skill alive if you like, but um, it's a bit of a lost cause if you can't actually find a market for that product at the end of the day. So you can see the future being more of a, a, a heritage museum type mm. exhibition mm. rather than a, a, yeah. A, yeah. A, a production thing. What do you envision happen to you know, this, this site then? Other than you? Well, that, that's very much in the hands of um, uh, English Heritage with their listing provisos. And uh, yeah, what, how, how the local council interpret um, that. I mean, the, the, the history of the other one was that the owner um, couldn't really afford to maintain a building that had no use. And so the local council compulsory purchased it. Um, and now they're stuck with a building they don't quite know what to do with. But I think they will produce, they, they will eventually um, come up with a working museum. Quite what sort of footfall they're going to get for people to see it, apart from uh, the odd uh, parcel of school children, I really don't know. 
for yourself. You know, obviously, you've been in it as a life career and a passion for yourself. If you could go back to the day one when you walked into this, knowing what you know now, would you cap would you do all this all again? I'd certainly do it all again. Um, I might. Uh, I'm an engineer before I got here. I might um, exert a bit more influence in getting uh, more up-to-date machinery to do more up-to-date products. I think we have always rather lagged behind on the technology side. Is that because of the, the process was always an, an old way of doing it and it never changed? Yeah, sort of thing. I mean, it did, it did adapt to synthetics um, very easily. There were, there were no great um, you know, rebuilds. We just sort of wound a different material onto the machine and it took care of it. But the machines were, they produced cord of brilliant quality, but they were incredibly slow. Um, and, well, as I said, they were built in, in the factory down the road in 1875. So, um, you know, they were well out of date by the time I got here in, in the late 60s. Um, and it took us a long time uh, through until the 80s before I started to put in some, some decent modern plant, by which time, you know, Portugal and people like that. I mean, I was talking to a chap, trying to give him a quote to braid some uh, black yarn for fishing. And I can't buy the yarn for the price he wanted to buy the cord from me. And we normally reckon to at least double the yarn price, if not more, to cover the other heads. Yeah, as a final question, Neil, is as a young person, if a young person wanted to come into this industry, and obviously it's a very specialist craft, what advice would you give them to um, get into it or start into it? Well, my son is looking at um, the whole site, and he's doing a master's in um, conservation archaeology. A conservation architecture, I beg your pardon. And that, I think, is the essential thing for this site. Um, what you actually do with it then, um, and I think it might well be something to do with rope or cordage, but I don't know. But um, th there, is, there is some hope on the horizon there.